Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is James Thompson. I am a proud Yorta Yorta man uh, from the Maroopna region in northern northeast of Victoria, and I'm an engagement projects officer in the metropolitan region at the First Peoples Assembly of Victoria. Now, just before we do start, I'd like to just go over our uh, meeting protocols, and I'll just be popping those into the chat. So I'll just quickly go through them uh, for everyone who might not be able to have access to the chat. Uh, so for our meeting protocols, we are all equals. And we pay our respects to our elders, past, present, and emerging. We conduct ourselves with honesty and integrity, and we respect each other and our differing opinions. We respect our, we pay our respects to cultural differences and requirements, and we follow the agenda and processes. We are accountable and neutral, and everyone has an opportunity for input without being talked over. Everyone gets a fair go, and we talk about the issues, not making it personal. We avoid personal disagreements and arrive open-minded and listen to all points of view. And most importantly, we remain calm and respectful whilst talking and making your points. So yeah, so tonight I'm coming to you from the lands of the Rundry people, and I would uh, and I want to start by paying my respects to their elders, past and present. I would also like to acknowledge the lands and waters of the places in which we are all joining tonight. I would like to acknowledge any First Nations people joining us this evening, and I would also like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Uncle Jack Charles, and I would also like to organise us to have a one minute silence in respect, in respect to his passing. So I will just start that now. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm also just noticing in the chat that there are some people who are having issues with the sound. Can I just double check with our panelists that uh, they are able to hear me? And uh, if anyone in the chat is able to, if anyone is able to in the uh, attendees able to just let me know if they can hear me or not. Okay, I've got one thumbs up, a couple, oh, a couple thumbs up. So I think we're doing all right. Lovely. So, uh, yeah, if you do have any issues in regards to the sound, I would suggest going through the app. Uh, also, we will be uh, recording this meeting tonight. So if there is any issues in regards to not being able to hear the sound, we will have a recording of this. So, yes, a big thank you to everyone who's joining us here live and to everyone who submitted questions in advance. Or perhaps you're now watching this as a recording. If so, hello to you and thank you for joining us. As I said, it looks like people are still arriving, but I'll kick on with some quick introductions for our panel tonight. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Gunai Kurnai woman Kayleen Williamson is an apology for tonight, but we have three of the Assembly's elected members representing the metropolitan area here to answer all of your questions. I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm happy to start. <laughs> um, so my name's Alistair Thorpe. I'm a Gunai Yorta Yorta Gunditjamara Wurundjeri Wurrung man, and I'm a member for the Metropolitan Region. Um, and I'm just really happy to be here tonight and um, answer people's questions and talk about where we're at in the uh, process. Uh, yeah, Nyata. Uh, my name is Ruben Berg. I'm a Gunijmara man, and I'm here in in uh, Melbourne on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. So acknowledge them as well, uh, and also a member of the Metropolitan 
uh, elected groups for here for the First People's Assembly of Victoria. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Nagara Murray and I'm a First Nations woman of the Wamba Wamba, Yorta Yorta Jaja Warang and Dutaroa peoples. And I'm the Metropolitan Member, an Executive Member and the Treaty Committee Co-Convener along with Troy MacDonald on the Assembly. And um, it's good to be here tonight. I acknowledge that I'm on Wurundjeri country um, and I can't see any of our people that have joined us tonight. So maybe if you're putting your chat where you come from or what land you're on tonight. Deadly. Thank you so much for that, uh, all of our panellists. Uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, our panellists are all from the metropolitan region. They are three of the 31 members that currently make up the First People's Assembly of Victoria. Uh, the Assembly, of course, is the democratically elected voice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the journey to treaty in Victoria. So if your mob in Victoria, whether your mob is from interstate or here, the Assembly is here to represent you. And if you are not already, I highly recommend that you enroll with the Assembly. This is the best way to show your support for treaty, but also to make sure that you have your say and help decide the next steps on the journey towards treaty. Now, Nagara, I might throw, uh, throw this one to you to open up tonight with a quick explanation for anyone who might be joining us for the first time. Can you give us a quick recap of what the Assembly is currently tasked with? That being, what is and what is it that the Assembly members have been working on since you were elected in 2019? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, um, really, since we've been elected since 2019, um, we've been working really hard, actually, over the last kind of two and a half years. Um, but we have a really strong purpose and really clear objectives as to what we were to achieve as members on the Assembly. And that's really um, three things, three main things which we kind of come up with which is also tied to legislation. And that was, um, you know, the treaty negotiation framework, the treaty authority, and a self-determination fund that reflects what our communities want in the spirit of self-determination. So we've hit the ground running um, to come up with all the different elements of the treaty negotiation framework to enable treaty making um, in the second term of the assembly. It hasn't been easy, um, you know, with a, a global health pandemic, um, throughout that time, it's been really hard and we would have liked to get out more to community, but we have spent a lot of time talking with our people and getting an understanding and feedback of how people think things should have unfolded as we worked towards treaties for our people and on the framework. And we're really trying to facilitate a new era of relations um, and interactions with First Nations people and the state of Victoria. Um, so they, those are really important um, elements of the work that we are doing. Um, throughout all that, we've also developed an additional pathway to recognise other nations on the membership of the Assembly. Um, we're still working on our interim elders voice. We've also developed some guiding principles for a, a new youth voice. Um, you know, we worked hard um, to get the Europe Justice Commission established. Um, and I think recently, um, now we're working on our second treaty day out. Um, so it's never ending for us really on the assembly um, and there's been a lot of work and a lot of hard work put in but I think all of us together have um, worked well together um, for the common purpose of treaties for our people in Victoria. Deadly. Thank you so much for that, Nagara. And I think, yes, it has been quite the journey to date. And as you mentioned, especially with uh, the global pandemic that we've uh, been all currently going through. And I think it's also really important that we do uh, acknowledge the hard work uh, that the Assembly members, as well as the staff at the Assembly, have been going through during this pandemic. Uh, even though we have been a little bit uh, tied with the pandemic, we still have been working our tails off to get out to community. And yeah, we've been able to have yarns with us over the last 12 months. We've been able to have yarns with over 23,000 people, either online or in person. So, which really gives you a sense of scale and the sense of effort that the assembly goes to to make sure that what we are currently doing is what our community is voicing to us. Now, Alistair, 
I know, I know tonight the plan for this event is to really dive into some of the nuts and bolts of things like the treaty negotiation framework and the self-determination fund and allow people to ask questions about the details. But before we do that, I was hoping you might first offer a big picture view of why these details are so important. So can you remind us why a treaty is so important? What's it all about? And what do you hope to, will be able to deliver to First Nations people in Victoria? Thanks, James. Um, and I think I'd just like to also acknowledge all the work we've done so far to get us to this point. Um, and the, you know, some of the things that we've been able to develop and put in place already. Uh, so I think um, the work that we've all put in together has been pretty significant. And I'm probably one of the things that we need to do better is to communicate that and actually tell our people where we're at in the process. So I think that's a good recap, Nagaro, that you just gave us um, to really demonstrate what we're doing because it's a lot of hard work that we have put in. But probably a couple of things that we're working on at the moment and it talks about our broader you know, goals to have treaties is around the future of the assembly and the work that we're going to be doing and how we negotiate a treaty on behalf of all of these nations in the state. Um, so I think treaties have been on, you know, in our conversations for a long time. I'd like to recognise all our past leaders that have talked about this, you know, way back in the early days, you know. So this isn't a new conversation, but what we've got is an opportunity right now to actually deliver on treaties and to be at the table and negotiate uh, for the first time, really, and being able to set that up with equal footing is really important for us. And it's about nation building. It's about recognising our sovereignty. It's about acknowledging the past injustices. We're well on the way to doing that through Europe. So I think we've got a, there's a lot of things in place now that our community can really draw upon and use. We've got tools there to actually mobilise and to build our nations again and to rebuild. So I think we can't let go of that. Like while we've got it, we can't let go. And as an assembly member, I'm gonna fight hard for our self-determination, sovereignty, and our human rights. And we're, we're, all of those things are being weaved into the framework and weaved into the mechanisms. So I think that's really important to know. And what we hopefully will be able to tell you tonight is a bit more detail about how that will happen within each of those key pieces. Um, so, yeah, I think our people should be excited. And, and and the other thing I reckon is really important too is that the work that we're doing, and you see the broader conversation nationally around voice, treaty, truth, we're already doing it. We're already... You know, we're not waiting for anybody. We're going to put that in place here, how we want to do it from our perspective as traditional owners in Victoria. But I think it is triggering, triggering a national conversation about treaty. And I think that's really important. And then that other states get on board and we can keep doing that conversation. Deadly, thank you so much for that, Alistair. You've really painted a picture of where the aspirations of the assembly is looking to achieve for our community. Uh, now we'll, we'll switch it up a little bit and we'll be going from a little bit more of the, uh, from the macro to the micro. Uh, but I will also just like to make a quick reminder that we will be getting, uh, the, getting to the audience questions soon. So please, if you hear anything here and you think, hang on, I wanna know a little bit more about this, you can put your question into the chat and we'll try to get through to, we'll try to get through as many as we possibly can with the time that we have. Now, Ruben, my next question will be for you. So you've been intimately involved in the negotiations with the government to set this treaty negotiation framework. So you've been, you've been in amongst the details. Uh, before we jump into the Q&A, do you mind just stepping us through a bit of an overview of what the framework is? Many people hopefully saw the news in June that the assembly reached the agreement with the government about the shape and form of that of the treaty authority will take. And this is the umpire that will oversee treaty negotiation, one that is led by first peoples and grounded in our culture. 
but what is the framework and what are the key elements? And perhaps take your time with this one as I imagine a number of questions tonight will be focused on this. So Ruben, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, thanks, James. Yeah, I'm more than happy to try and um, talk through in a, in a bit of detail around what the actual treaty negotiation framework is. And I think there's a couple of things at the top to make really clear um, about the treaty negotiation framework. And one is that it's not a treaty. So we're not at the stage of actually negotiating treaty outcomes. What the framework is about is the process for treaties. And as we've heard, it's been a long struggle for a long time to try and get this treaty conversation to happen. And that's because we haven't had treaties before. And because we haven't had them before, it's a bit of an unknown about what the process should really look like to actually have treaties. So the framework is the document we've been working on, drawing from community input, drawing, drawing from member input, and negotiating with the state about what that process for treaties is going to look like. So that's, that's a really important thing to understand. It's not actual treaty outcomes. It's just talking about the process of treaties. And also really importantly, just like we hope treaties will be, it's not a fixed document. It's a document that will able to have some flexibility to it so that we can make adjustments and amendments as we might need to along the way. So I think those are really important things to understand at the start of, of talking about the framework. But so what does it actually do? Uh, what it does is it spells out a few really important things. So the first thing it tries to talk about is kind of the overarching principles of if you are going to be a part of the treaty process, you know, what do you need to be kind of agreeing to? And it sets out some of the guiding principles that parties, so when a party is a group that's going to be part of the process, whether that's the state, whether that's a traditional owner group, whether that's a statewide body, whether it's local councils, whoever's participating, that's referred to as a party. And so the parties to the process need to agree that they're going to follow certain protocols, that they're going to behave in certain ways, which is about being respectful, which is about uh, you know, being mindful of other people's views, a whole lot of those things that you need to agree to to be part of the process. That's an important element. The other really important thing it sets out is then who are those parties? Who is it that can participate in a, a treaty process? And what we've been really strong about in the work we've been doing as the assembly, hearing views from community, is that we wanna make sure that that process is as, as open as possible. And so we, we recognize that there are already groups with rights that they've attained from the state or from the Commonwealth. And so we're recognizing those rights within that process, uh, but we're also recognizing that there are other groups who might not have that status yet or might not have chosen to pursue that. And we made sure there's an avenue within the framework to say that they can come along and put their hand up and say that they wanna be a part of the treaty process. And so that's one of the important things that the framework sets out. Who is it that can be a part of the process? And to do that, we set out these things called minimum standards. And so that sets out what is it that you need to achieve to say that you are uh, eligible to participate in a treaty process. And that talks about things like, you know, what is, the, what is the area of country that you want to actually have a treaty on? How are you ensuring that you're inclusive of that community, of the traditional owners on that place, but also of other First Nations peoples of that place? How is it you're making sure that you've got the right leadership in place to be able to make decisions uh, on behalf of that community? And so those are the types of things that we've set about uh, trying to put as those minimum standards. Really importantly, we'll talk about those minimum standards and quite distinct from what we see in other places is that the state has no role to play in deciding whether a group meets those minimum standards. It's up to groups to say that they feel like they meet it, to put it out to community to see if they meet it. And then ultimately for the treaty authority to work with groups to try and address some of those things. So that's a really important part of the process of the framework that we've been we've putting, putting in place. That's for the local traditional owner-based treaties that we've set out within the framework. And so the framework does set out two different types of treaties that could be achieved through this process and has been agreed to with the state. And that is that you will have local traditional owner-based treaties that will deal with local business but there'll also be a statewide uh, treaty as well. And the body who's going to be doing that is we're putting forward that it will be the assembly who will be able to play that role. Really importantly though, it's not the assembly as we currently are, it would be the assembly after another set of elections where it's been really clear that the intention is that people can come out and vote for who they want to be at the table to negotiate statewide treaty. So that's the proposal we're putting in there at the moment in terms of the framework for those, um, those two different elements, the statewide and the local traditional owner-based treaties. They're also really importantly within the framework, minimum standards for the state. 
So it's not just assume that the state is ready to come and negotiate. There are requirements that they have to meet to show that they're ready to sit at the table, uh, which includes things like ensuring that they have the proper authority uh, to make decisions, that they are inclusive of the broader community as well. They're bringing the broader community on as part of these conversations and their commitments as well, that they're going to follow those processes about being respectful of taking into account our, our cultural law, uh, our authority, all those sorts of things, uh, things that they also have to commit to, to be a part of the process. So once we actually have parties actually sign up, the framework sets out that you, you put it on a database and then you go through a process of forming a delegation which is going to be one collective group that will negotiate treaty for one particular area. So the idea is not that there will be overlapping treaties, there will just be one group who will negotiate treaty over one particular area. But the process of determining that group, that delegation will be up to communities to be involved with. It's not just based on the existing status groups, they will have a role to play within that. We need to ensure that their rights are still recognized but it will be open to all groups to put their hand up and say they want to be a part of that delegation. And it will be the treaty authority who facilitates that. So once we actually have these delegations, we've got these groups who meet the minimum standards, we've got the state who meets the minimum standards, then the framework sets out the process that happens next. And that is that the groups come together, the parties come together and try and work out what is they want to negotiate as part of treaty. And a really, really important part of the framework is that there was an opportunity within legislation where the state could have said, these certain things are not able to be negotiated. It could have said that, no, we're not prepared to negotiate on certain aspects of uh, the state, how they run things. But what we've pushed for and what we've been able to achieve is agreement that nothing is off the table. When groups come to negotiate uh, treaty, they'll have a clean slate of what they wanna put on the table to negotiate. And that's been a really important thing we've been pushing for. And it's an important part of the underlying principle behind all the work we're doing which is to not make any decisions that cut things out at this stage. We wanna make sure that the process is an op as open as possible. It's as open as possible to whatever groups wanna be a part of it. It's as open as possible to whatever topics you wanna to talk about. That's been a really fundamental part of what we've pushed for in terms of this framework. So you then talk about what it is that you wanna actually achieve, what do you wanna negotiate on? And there's a process then whereby the treaty authority can support those conversations uh, to make sure that those negotiations are done respectfully, that they are taken into account uh, Aboriginal law, law and cultural authority, and so that you can have those conversations. And there's also a really important element of the framework in that parties, when they're coming to negotiate, can agree to interim agreements. So you could look at a, a treaty process whereby it's only at the very end, after you resolve every little thing, that you actually finally have a treaty. And that could draw things out quite a long time and you won't see any outcomes for quite some time. But the framework importantly sets out that you can reach interim agreements. So you could do smaller little parts of your agreement as part of treaty along the way and agree to those and start to implement those without having to have resolved every single part of it. So that's another really important part of the framework that it sets out the capacity for interim agreements. There's also then a process for what happens when you finalize it. What's the process for finishing off the treaty process? And importantly, allowing again, a chance for flexibility that groups could go back and negotiate different aspects of that if they choose, but a process for ensuring that it's formalized and we're pushing in certain ways to make sure the state can recognize that in the highest level possible, whether that's for statewide treaty to be recognized within the constitution, uh, whether there's legislative change that needs to be made to recognize those treaty arrangements. That's also a really important part of formalizing the process. And then once you've formalized the treaty, it spells out also the ways which you're gonna make sure that uh, groups are complying with that treaty. So it's not just a case of signing it off and then who knows if anyone's gonna follow it or not. There's processes that can be set out about how you're going to make sure that the things that have been agreed to are actually happening and the treaty authority can play a continuing role in that. So that's a bit of a snapshot about where things are at in terms of that framework. I'm sure there's gonna be lots of other detailed nuanced questions there, but the really important things just again to reiterate it's not about finalized treaties. It's not about outcomes. It's about a process for treaty. We've tried to make it as inclusive as, as possible at every step of the way. And there is still that flexibility. If there are stuff we do need to change down the track that we can do that as well. Can I just add on, sorry, James, can I add on to- Not a problem, Alistair, the floor that, is yours. So, and the framework's actually in draft at the moment. so. We still got to have a decision to make as an assembly about that framework. So that's coming up in our next chamber.
but I also wanted to just highlight the importance of the Aboriginal law and cultural protocols within the framework. It's very, it's been put up front and it's a, it's a tool that our nations can use to actually determine how treaties are done on country. So I think that's a really key element of this framework that everybody should really look at in detail. And probably the other thing is, I know we've got fact sheets about the framework, is that right? About where we're at with it. So I think that might give you another way to look at it and visualize how it's gonna actually work. So maybe we can share them with whoever wants to see those as well. Thank you for that, Alistair. And uh, basically, there's a lot of information that's been squeezed in there. And uh, as Alistair was alluding to, we do have a lot of resources on our website uh, in regards to the treaty negotiation framework. Uh, we on our uh, event on the event page on the events landing page, as well as on our website, there is a link to a video of a 20 minute presentation that Ruben gave recently in regards to the treaty negotiation framework. So. If you are looking for a bit more, few more details or a way of digesting it in a little bit of a slower sort of manner, uh, you can jump on our website and have a look at that video. Now, hopefully that's given all of you a, a really solid picture of why we're here working towards this thing called treaty and what's happened so far and where we find ourselves at this particular point in time on this journey. Uh, so now I'm going to jump into the Q&A component of tonight. Uh, I might start with the questions that we currently have from our mem uh, from our uh, attendees tonight. So I'll start with uh, the first question from uh, Davina, and I might throw this to you, Nagara. Uh, can you please tell me how us mob, whose traditional country is elsewhere, i.e. Queensland or South Australia, how do we fit within the treaty? Yep. So obviously, you know, through colonization, we've been dispossessed, dispersed and moved around and we don't all live on our traditional lands. Um, and what we've made sure within the framework that it's inclusive of all First Peoples and Aboriginal and Tosh Islander people that live in Victoria will benefit um, from treaties here on country. Um, so they'll be absolutely included in that process. And that's just our way of doing things and doing business that we're inclusive, that we don't leave anyone behind. Um, and the framework, as I said, it's very inclusive of all peoples um, that lives on our country here in Victoria. Um, so that kind of answers the question, I hope. Um, and we've also been really big on encouraging inclusion and unity, um, but with an emphasis as well on the importance of cultural authority and decision making as First Nations, but also centering Aboriginal law, law and cultural authority. And obviously that means everyone that lives on our beautiful lands here um, in Victoria. Deadly. Thank you so much for that, Nagara. Uh, this one I might throw to you, Ruben. Uh, what will treaty mean and, and achieve for my Gunajamara family living in Nam? Yeah, so I mean that that that's that's the kind of the aspiration is where we're all heading towards is what treaty outcomes will actually mean for our communities. And it, it will be different for different communities based on where they are and what their association is with, with different places. But if I look at it at a, at a kind of the, the top level from my mind about what treaties can achieve, I guess regardless of where you're living and, and where you're from, to be honest, is what we're trying to do through this treaty process is we're trying to take a whole bunch of decisions that currently are made by the state are made by government, um, are made by bureaucrats, and take those decisions and move them away from the state. So that what we want is if there's matters out there that directly affect First Nations peoples, we want those things to be decided by First Nations peoples. That's what treaty will be able to achieve in my mind. And so it's, it's really about taking those decision-making powers away from the state and handing them over to either a statewide body who has that authority, who's been elected by the people to make those decisions, or if they're local traditional owner-based decisions, giving those decisions to those traditional owner groups to be able to make themselves. So ultimately what it will mean in, on the ground is whatever communities want it to mean for them, because the power to make those decisions will be in our hands. Uh, and so I, th I think that's, that's, to me, what's inspiring me to be doing the work that I'm doing, knowing that that's kind of what we're aspiring to. We don't need to know the detailed ins and outs of 
what might change, uh, what we need to make sure is that the decisions about that change sits in our hands at that whatever level is appropriate uh, from our community perspective. Deadly, thank you so much for that, Ruben. Um, now this next one, I'll throw to you, Alistair. Uh, words like sovereignty, self-determination, freedom and truth are often used. Yet for the average person, these concepts are quite, aren't quite clear. We all, mob and non-mob, could do with some clear definitions on these terms. Could the panelists elaborate on the meaning behind them? Thanks for that question. <laughs> I think this is a really, you know, one of the fundamental concepts of a treaty, isn't it? It's around sovereignty and who has it. And I think what's been pretty strongly articulated throughout our process is that we haven't ceded sovereignty. It's throughout all the legislation. It's within all the frameworks that we're creating. We're asserting that sovereign right as traditional owners. So I think people need to look at those legis the legislation behind this work and it's in our it's in the preamble I think to our framework so it's what we're doing is we're saying sovereignty our sovereignty isn't on the table so we're never going to concede that and I can see in the chat there someone else asked that question but it does raise in interesting issues around it too I think Australia is going to go through a change we're in a time of change around sovereignty and so I think we're going to actually ask that question fundamentally as Australians too so what does that mean but in this process we won't concede it um the other definitions there too I think we've built that into a lot of our documents a lot of our um, pieces of work that we've already done so we have defined it to a degree it's probably useful for us as an assembly to put together a glossary of that I think someone mentioned that I think that would be a good idea, have a shared understanding of what we mean. But also, ultimately, it's up to the group to determine how they practice this. You know, this is this is the beauty of this. It's going to be up to your traditional owner group to do that. You're going to have to determine what that means for you and for your nation. And when we do a treaty, that's on the table, what you want to, how you want to define it. And I think people got to grab hold of that. And so that means you need to mobilise, get get active, be part of your group. Don't wait on the side and then, you know, I think now's the time to contribute. So I think the great questions in this chat too, I really love the questions that people are putting through and anything that we can't answer, I hope our team will put, you know, capture and maybe we can send out a bit of a response afterwards. But... I think there is a fear there around sovereignty about that. And I understand that. My family has been heavily involved in that idea, how we exercise it as Aboriginal people. So um, we're, that's not ever out of our minds. And, and the next assembly that goes through and starts to negotiate, we'll have to embed that within that treaty negotiation. And it's going to be a challenge. It is. So I'll be honest about that. We're going to have to really fight hard to have that respected. But that's what it's all about. We have the opportunity right now to do that. Thank you so much for that, Alistair. Um, now, this next one I might put to you, Nagara. Uh, where are the foundations of the process coming from for those treaty processes? So in a sense, where are we gaining our knowledge from in regards to past achievements from other nations in regards to the treaty process and how are we incorporating those into our own processes during this journey? So everything that we've talked about over the last two and a half years, but as Alistair said earlier, this goes way back when our people have been calling for treaty for so long. Um, so everything that we feed into the framework is from all those conversations and yarns and dialogues and everything we participated in for a long time, but mainly, you know, over the last two and a half years. And we've always considered feedback from our people to feed in. So all the cup of teas and yarns we've had and people ringing us up, asking us and having the big yarns, you know, that all gets fed back into the process. And we're taking ownership of that process because for too long, the government's had the power and we're taking that power back and putting it into our hands to say, this is what we want. 
when it comes to treaties on our country. Um, so I think that our mob need to know that we've always got them in the back of our mind, no matter what we do. And all those yarns we've heard growing up as kids um, to now, um, we consider all that knowledge that we've fed into this process. Um, so it's really exciting. Um, you know, we've still got some work to do to rebuild our Aboriginal governance and build on our own collective cultural identities and collective decision-making. Um, but we're in a really good position, I feel. Um, so yeah, everything, it's a combination of all our brains on the assembly, all our traditional owner groups, all the people that live um, in Victoria, um, all Aboriginal Tasha Islander people. Sorry, my son's phone's going off here. Um, but yeah, um, that's kind of from my perspective. Um, and we've, we've, we've communicated with community in many different ways. We've done surveys, we've got out in communities and talked with them. Um, we've got a hotline, you know, for the elders to ring up. Um, we've got all you mob, um, James, around, you know, engagement teams going out to community to get their um, thoughts. And, you know, within the assembly, we've unpacked it many times, we've pulled it apart, all the different elements from the treaty authority to how would Europe operate, um, you know, to how the framework will sit and how we're inclusive. So, yeah, I think it's a combination of many, um, you know, brilliant minds. And I also want to acknowledge too that all the people that have contributed um, to get us to where we are at this point, um, we always acknowledge um, their contributions. Thank you so much, Nagara. And I think it is really important that we do acknowledge the expertise and the effort that everyone is putting into this process. Uh, now, I also might follow this up with another question for you, Nagara. Uh, so obviously we've had great work done on the processes for the Treaty Authority. How and who will get to be involved in the statewide treaty and the uh, negotiations of this? So really the work that we've done up to this point, it's really been kind of setting the treaty landscape. Um, and we're just talking now around what Assembly 2.0 will look like and the next iteration of the Assembly. Um, and that are we the Aborig Aboriginal representative body to negotiate the statewide treaty? Absolutely, we think that we are and that we're positioned to do that. And um, we still need to get a mandate. Um, that's really important to us. So, you know, getting more of our nations um, sitting at the table is really important to us to build that mandate, to build consensus. You know, our reserve seat members need to go back to their mobs and start to build consensus within their traditional owner groups. Um, and we've got to keep continuing those conversations of what that will look like. Um, but at the moment, obviously, we're getting really close to the finalisation of the treaty negotiation framework. As Alistair said, we'll meet on the 26th of September um, to vote on it and to get the, that endorsement that we need. Um, so I think that the next iteration, so the next assembly members that jump on next term, they'll be the ones that will, will lead that discussion on the statewide negotiations. Um, and it's really important that all our mob start to get involved where they can and participate, um, you know, sign up to your traditional owner corporations, enroll to vote. That's gonna be really important about who you wanna sit on the assembly and negotiate a statewide treaty. Um, so yeah. It's, it's, it's super important, um, but we're working towards that and having those yarns now. So we'd love to hear from community about what they think um, a statewide treaty will look like and how we'll do it. And are we mandated to do it? We built consensus. That's all the big questions we're talking about now. Deadly, thank you so much for that. Um, I'll throw this one over to you, Ruben. Uh, what cultural laws will be in place and how will they be enacted? And also what consequences will there be if they aren't adhered to? Yeah, great question. And there's a lot of great questions out there. Actually, we're, we're keeping track of all the different questions there. And um, as Al said before, if we don't get a chance to get to all of them, we'll try and answer in some way. And you can always reach out to each of us individually. We're more than happy to answer these questions too. But um, the particular question there was around uh, law, Aboriginal law, and how will that be kind of implemented within the process? And it's a really important part of the framework that we haven't tried to detail what law is because we know that it's different for different groups, for different people. There's a different sense of what that might mean. But what we've done is that we've empowered the treaty authority to be able to work with groups who are participating in the process 
to understand what is the law that they want to have apply to the treaty process so that they can then articulate that, can describe that to the other groups who are going to be a part of it so that the state understands what the law is that will apply to the negotiations. And once that's been described and once it's been understood that that's the law that's going to apply, the treaty authority will have a role in ensuring that the groups actually follow the law that's been set out. So there's the process there to enable groups to describe what that means for themselves, how they want it to work, and then the treaty authority there to um, make sure that, that it does is followed. And we also have, amongst all the other things we've mentioned, we've got things like the self-determination fund as a way of supporting groups. So they can go through that process of understanding what law from a cultural perspective they want to apply to the negotiations they're part of. And then once you actually get to a, a treaty, there could be a whole lot of other stuff that groups decide of how they want their law to be embedded with the treaty that they negotiate. But that's gonna be up to them when they sit down to have that negotiation. Beautiful, thank you so much for that, Ruben. I'll throw this over to Alistair. And it's a question that I think a couple of people have been asking in the chat uh, in regards to timelines. Uh, for example, for the treaty authority, for the negotiations to progress and other works of the assembly. Uh, we obviously understand that a lot of this is based around uh, two parties coming together and making these uh, decisions. So timeframes can be a little bit difficult to be exactly specific, but I think what we're looking for is just a bit of a general overview of what we're looking at in regards to timeframes. Timeframes, my favorite thing. <laughs> um, well, I think there's two timelines here. There's a, well, our, you know, we've got our community timelines, which has been 230 odd years of occupation here and how long we've been trying to get to this point, you know. So that's a historical context that we're all in. So however long this takes, that's how long it takes. That's in my opinion. We, we've got to just do it right. But in saying that, this, our assembly elected group now we've got three key pieces of work to do before our terms end which is end of next year and that's the treaty authority which has been already legislated or it's been endorsed we've got that so we've done that work we're, we're finishing off the work on the fund and we're also finishing off the treaty negotiation framework but once they once we've created that treaty landscape then I would see this as an ongoing negotiation. You know, we've created this architecture now. And as we negotiate, I think we're going to be able to work that out as we go, how long we need to take to negotiate. Um, we've got a lot of things to talk about. You know, there's a lot of issues to discuss. That's going to take time. Our nation's also got to do a lot of work to, you know, get ready. To, to have, you know, to be treaty ready. So I think the timeline's really, um, for me, it's more important to do it right. And that's what we're really striving to do. I think we've, we've committed to that as a group and I think we're getting there, um, you know, but the next step will be the next election, which will go into um, the, the second part of the um, assembly. So. Yeah, I, I think we, we've got some pretty clear um, targets there, but also it's once that's done, it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, and I just can I just add to that too, and saying that the idea of us being able to put in the place in the framework the interim agreements will mean that it's not doesn't have to be this thing we have to wait twenty years until there's actually an agreement because you don't need mm. every single part of it to be finished. We'll, we should be able to see within a reasonable time frame, none of us wants to put a time on it exactly, but within a reasonable time frame, some of those interim agreements start to happen and that should involve already the handing over of some of that power. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's hard to know exactly what that time frame will look like, but I wouldn't expect it to be like we saw in some other nations where it's 20 years before you see any outcomes at all. That's not what we're trying to set up here, that sort of process. Yeah, but I think too, it's the ability to renegotiate. So. There's, we're not going to have a one statewide treaty and then that's it, it's done. 
what we're going to do is create that open platform to say, all right, we want to renegotiate in five years or, you know, that'll be determined, but we're going to, the flexibility is there for that. Yes, I really do think that flexibility is an important part and something that should be uh, put forward to our communities is that there is that flexibility to renegotiate because our community and our society changes so quickly these days that it's so important that we're able to capture those changes. Um, and I also think it's really important that we are making sure that we are working on our community's timelines and we're not rushing this process. I think it's really important that we make sure that the work that we're doing is as struck is as detailed as possible. And we're making sure that our community is our community, both our mob and our allies are walking with us up on this journey. Now, Ruben, I might also I might chuck this one to you as well. Uh, so will the treaty process enable the Gura Ilam Wurrung to be able to negotiate their own treaty? At the moment, the uh, Gura Ilam Wurrung country has been divided between two other nations. We have been extinguished by their wraps without free and prior and informed consent as per uh, the UNDRIP. Can we represent ourselves as the sovereign people of our country? Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks, Uncle Vincent, for that question. So what, what will happen is what we're trying to do through this process is make sure that everybody has a chance to be included as part of the treaty process. And so what that means is that any group, regardless of the status they have now, if they can demonstrate that they meet those minimum standards, that is that they represent from a particular area and that they've got um, a way to be inclusive of the group that they represent, and that they've got appropriate leadership of that group. If they meet those minimum standards, then they get to go on to the database. They get to say that you're interested in the treaty process. What happens next though, is that if there are other groups who have a similar claim over a similar place that might overlap with some of that, that's when it's then up to the treaty authority to work with those groups in a culturally appropriate way, in a culturally safe way, uh, different from the systems we've had in the past, uh, so it's led by the treaty authority to try and work out a resolution to those things. So what that means, none of us can say exactly what that means. It could mean that there's a particular group that is given status or is not given status, but every group will have a chance to participate in that process. And there will be a, a mandated through the framework is that there needs to be a process of consultation, of discussion, of facilitated conversations. And at the very end of that, at the very last resort, it could be the case that the treaty authority does make a decision about who will form that delegation. And that delegation is could be a larger group, it could be a smaller group, is the group that's been determined will negotiate treaty over a, a particular area. And there will only be one treaty negotiated over one particular area. So that's, I guess, the best answer that I can give that I can say that if they meet the minimum standards, they'll be able to participate in that process and then it will be up to other groups if there is competing interest to have that discussion in a way that's different to the conversations we've had in the past. Um, so that's the system we've set up to try and make that happen. Uh, but if anyone else anyone else had any other things to add on to that, I'm happy to take other comments there too. Yeah, I, I just want to add something. Um, and I just want to acknowledge Uncle Vincent and also acknowledge that traditional owners have, have viewed the state's involvement in previous negotiations and recognition processes negatively that has happened and I think one of the things when we came onto the assembly was that we're unraveling all these imposed systems and structures and legislations we're tied to and even the government defining who we are as peoples our identity so trying to take more control back around that and as Ruben said um we're encouraging inclusion and unity and if groups don't have that and they're leaving people out or excluding well, then they won't be eligible for treaties because we're trying to unify our people here. And I think that's why um, we're trying to have really flexible, inclusive and unified mechanism for enabling traditional owners to, co to collectively come together and negotiate. And that's going to take time as well for us to come together. Um, and I think the cultural mapping and the nation building, that's all really important elements. And even nation to nation dialogues and coming together, I think, you know, we're probably going to need treaties amongst ourselves. Um, to start to come together and have those dialogues and conversations. But I just wanted to acknowledge um, that, and Uncle Vincent, um, I know you've put a few questions in the chat 
Thanks. Thank you for that, Nagara. And I might pose another question to you. Uh, now, just before that, I would just like to reiterate something that the panelists have both, all three have said. Uh, we obviously are going to be trying to get to as many questions as possible tonight. Uh, if there, if we are unable to get to every single question, or if you want a bit more details, what I'll be doing at the end of this webinar and Q and A is I will be putting in my work email. So what I would then suggest doing is passing on those questions to me, and I'm more than happy to pass those through to our members and get a response and reply that back to you. Uh, so yes, in regards to the question I had for you, Nagara, uh, how will the self-determination fund be managed and what safeguards are there? So everything is always done above board and in the interest of community. Yep. Um, so the assembly is negotiating the establishment of a first people's controlled and managed self-determination fund. Um, and that's for us to drive our own economic institution. So our own priorities and aspirations and how to determine how to build capacity and wealth and prosperity for not only all our mob now, but for future generations. Um, so we'll be responsible for managing and administrating that self-determination self fund. Um, and that means that's our people making decisions around financial resources. Um, and obviously we'll make sure that there's strong accountability um, mechanisms in place around that. We've had a, a huge amount of work that's been put into the self-determination um, fund. And it means also that our people will be making decisions about those financial resources. And that's to get people at the table because there is that imbalance of power. So trying to get equal footing, getting our mob at the table so that they're armed um, with the right skill sets, the right expertise, the right negotiation teams to be able to sit at the table and negotiate their treaties. Um, but we've done a, a load of work um, around it and the way that it will be established. And it's a really exciting piece of work. Thank you for that, Nagara. Uh, Alistair, I'll ask you this one. Uh, could you explain clearly how this process is not endorsing sovereignty to the state of Victoria, or are we endorsing the state's sovereignty through the act of committing to treaties with them? Thanks, James. I, I think I probably touched on that a little bit before about the sovereignty issue and how we're, we're not conceding sovereignty, we're not ceding sovereignty, we're throughout all of our materials, everything that we're putting in place, that's not on the table. So I think um, that can be sort of that fear. We hopefully can put that to rest. Uh, it's being built in to everything. So, and as I said before, it'll be up to each group to exercise those rights um, through the through the process, through the through the negotiation of a treaty. Um, what that looks like, we don't know. You know, I think that's the the next part is how does how does that negotiation play out? Um, but throughout everything in that we've talked about, that is um that won't be ceded and and it needs to be respected through this. So that's why we're here. That's why we're at the table. I think that's an acknowledgement there inherently of our sovereign rights as nations. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, it's a pretty, it's a question that will have to be unpacked a little bit more as we go through too. Thank you so much for that, Alistair. Uh, Ruben, I'll throw this one to you. Uh, so what will happen if there's a change of government? Uh, the longer the time frames, the greater the chance of a change of attitudes and the potential loss of faith in mob in not seeing changes. Yeah, um, look, that's a that's a great question and one that we're definitely mindful of as as the assembly. And I think what we saw with the support around the treaty authority is that there was really powerful bipartisan support when it came to actually voting on the treaty authority to pass that legislation. It had significant support from all sides of government there. So we feel like there is good support from both sides of of politics, um, and so we feel kind of relatively confident in that side of things. And that if we can, once we get these things better down, the, the, the authority, the framework, the self-determination fund, that will kind of set the guidelines of how this process is going to work, regardless of who the government actually is. Now, you know, you may well look at it and think that there could be different outcomes. You might be able to negotiate in the end if there are different governments in place, but there will be treaties. There is treaty coming here in Victoria, regardless of what happens at the next state election. 
that's 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 my view. Perfect. And I might just stick on the politics uh, thread a little bit. This is one of our pre-prepared questions. Uh, so, and I'll ask this to you, Ruben. Uh, how is the federal government's voice treaty and truth process going to fit in with Victoria's process? How will a national treaty work with the states and vice versa? Yeah, obviously, that's there's a lot of conversation as well happening across the nation around what treaty looks like. And I think it's really important to distinguish, you know, what it is that we're talking about. So we're here at the moment trying to set up a process whereby we can have treaties with the Victorian government. And that's because the Victorian government holds a whole lot of powers. They have a whole lot of responsibilities. They have a whole lot of decision-making powers. And the process we're talking about is what of those powers can we have transferred over to First Nations peoples? That's the crux of what we're doing. The Commonwealth also has a whole different set of powers and that they have different powers to the state. So we need treaties at the Commonwealth level to negotiate those powers that the Commonwealth only holds. And so they are really important processes that both need to be happening, but they don't conflict necessarily because we're talking about negotiating different powers from different levels of authority. So we need those things to be happening, but we need to make sure there's conversations happening at, at the, both those levels. So we've gone through a really important process now to have the assembly as uh, one of those ways of having a voice for Aboriginal people, especially around the treaty process. And we want to make sure that there's alignment between what's going on at the Commonwealth level around voice and what's going on at the state level. So there needs to be an interaction between them, the two, but I don't see them as being conflicting. They're about a different set of rights that can be accessed from different levels of authority. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Ruben. I think it is really important that we do uh, acknowledge the work that is currently being done both federally and by the and by a Victoria state. Um, as you said, both do not have to be separate entities and conflict with each other. This is something that one can inform the other and vice versa. Now, I have a question from Uncle Anthony, and I'll put this to you, Nagara. Uh, so if I understand correctly, the negotiations process is and always will be a live document for the treaty negotiation framework. Is it adjustable in terms of the self-determination fund of ownership of land, spaces and responsibilities to care for country? Yeah, so that's a, a big question. Um, maybe can you just repeat the first part of it? Not a problem. Uh, so if I understand correctly, the negotiation process is and always will be a live document for the treaty negotiation framework. Yes, is it so adjustable in terms of the self-determination of ownership of land, space, and responsibilities to care for country? Yep. No, that's a good question. I'm a big question. Um, yes, treaties will be a living and evolving document, and it'll be monitored and upheld at the discretion of the traditional owner groups and the parties that they enter into agreement with. And it will also be up to the traditional owner groups, the content of those treaties, because obviously we've got a statewide treaty. There'll be many treaties because then we've got all the local traditional owner treaties. And obviously that treaty that the groups enter into with their party can be amended by agreement of the parties. And I'm sure, um, as I said, there'll be many treaties and parties that will negotiate their subject matters, which would definitely include land and waters, our country, land back, um, and I suppose that's their business and at the discretion and determination of those groups that are entering into the agreements. So I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Nagara. Um, I'm just delving into a few more of the uh, questions that were submitted to us pre uh, earlier. Um, and I'll put this to you, uh, Ruben. Uh, in our consultations, we've heard about how existing state-run processes have failed to meet First Peoples' aspirations. How will treaty be different? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some really important ways that hopefully we've highlighted for people already around how this will be different. But the really important part of it is that when we're talking about how groups want to choose to identify who has the right to speak for country, it will no longer be the state who plays a role in deciding those things in terms of the treaty process. It will be about facilitating those conversations or about unity as Nagara was talking about. And that will all be facilitated and overseen by the treaty authority. 
and that's an independent authority that's got that's not controlled by government. They don't report to a minister. They're totally independent. And so they're the ones who will be able to bring important elements of law, uh, Aboriginal law and cultural authority as defined by how those groups want to define it to resolve some of those things. So that's how it can be really quite different from the things we've seen in the past. And also just want to make sure that we understand and reflect too around how it will be hopefully be different for um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples living here in Victoria who are not traditional owners, because we've spoken a fair bit around some of those traditional owner treaty aspects of it. And there's, there's two important ways that I think that this will be different for them as well. And that is that there's a clear um, spelling out within the framework that traditional owner groups will need to make sure that they're consulting and engaging with Aboriginal peoples who are not traditional owners, who are not from that area, but are still living in that area and have an interest in what happens. But absolutely at the statewide level, when we talk about statewide changes, those are things that are not just going to affect traditional owners, those are things that are gonna affect all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And the, the, the decisions around that will sit with this overall body that will be able to make those decisions and not with the state. So that's another really fundamental shift from where we see, see things at now and that we're empowering traditional owners. We're also trying to ensure that we're empowering other Aboriginal people who are not traditional owners from here in Victoria to make sure that there's outcomes for them as well through this process. Thank you for that, Ruben. And I might stay with you for this next question because I believe you'd probably be able to give us the best sort of overview of it. Uh, on the self-determination fund, is that going to come from government? And how do we ensure it continues? And in also in line with that, I think it'd be really beneficial for our audience if you would give us a bit of an overview in regards to the self-determination fund as we have looked at the treaty negotiation framework quite substantially tonight. I think it's really important that we do also have a an understanding of what the self-determination fund is gonna look like. Yeah, sure. So the self-determination fund is that really important third element. So we've got the treaty authority, we've got the framework and we've got the self-determination fund. And that's set out at the initial stages to be there as a resource so that groups and individuals who wanna come and be a part of the treaty process have the resources they need to be able to do that. It will also long-term hopefully be able to ensure that we're achieving greater outcomes, greater financial and economic independence for our communities. And so the, the money for that fund will initially come from the state. Uh, the state will be giving an initial partial um, uh, amount of money towards that fund. And then there will be opportunities for additional funds to be secured from the state. There'll be opportunities for additional funds to be sourced from other places that might, they might wanna support the work that we're doing, making sure that we're only receiving money from the types of organizations that we want to be receiving funds from to go into that fund. And, and the idea that it will build up uh, a, a resource there, uh, a financial resource that can be leveraged and used to uh, make sure that when we do want outcomes for our community, we don't have to go and, and beg for it from the government, that we have our own institution to be able to ensure that we're getting those outcomes for our community. And one of the things I'll be aspiring to, if we're able to be a part of the next process, is making sure that there's guaranteed ways of ensuring funds goes into that type of fund through things like proportion of taxation, a guaranteed way that we're not having to seek permission to get funds. We just have guaranteed certainty there'll be a certain amount of funds going into that and that the government has no oversight about what happens to those funds. We get to decide as First Nations peoples collectively what happens to those funds. That's, that's the purpose of that self-determination fund. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Ruben. And I'll pass this next one on to Alistair. Is it possible to create a clear definition of the difference between Aborig Aboriginal law, L-O-R-E, systems, sovereignty, and Western knowledge of law, Western knowledge systems of law, L-A-W? Especially when government bodies and programs use Aboriginal language, uh, it can be very confusing for mob and the broader community. Yeah, I think we're in the process of doing that through this through our work and determining what that is. But I think Ruben made a good point earlier about it'll be up to the groups themselves to map that out as part of that negotiation to say, this is what our law is here. So it's gonna be different depending on each group, um, but it's gonna interact with Western law, definitely. There's gonna be some, there might be times where that clashes and, how that affects the process 
is yet to be seen. I think we're all going to have to get ready and work out what kind of compromises we're going to have to make. The government will have to work that out too. So I think there's some questions yet to be answered about that. But we've created some really clear uh, concepts within all the things that we've put together. So I think there's scope there, though, to adapt or to um, respond through the process. So, um, but really, I think, yeah, each group needs to be considering what it means right now. They need to be getting ready and working that out within their own nation. Thank you so much for that, Alistair. And I'll ask this question of you, Nagara. Uh, the right to progress with a statewide, uh, statewide treaty, a statewide question is a big question as to how it'll be achieved. Is there a way to actually do that when our peoples have such unique experiences, needs and desires, and even whether or not they actually want a treaty? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think um, when it comes to a statewide treaty, that's what community agreed upon is to have a hybrid approach. So we'd have a statewide treaty and local treaties. We're still obviously setting the framework and the ground rules around it. I think there's a lot of conversations we need to have across our nations around that and how we are mandated. How do we build consensus um, and become active citizens of our nations to be able to support what that would look like? But I think, um, you know, once the framework's in place, it's going to be up to the traditional owner groups to find their entry point from that perspective. And then obviously whoever gets on the assembly in the next term, they will be the ones doing the treaty making on a statewide level. Um, so it's really important now that we get active, we contribute, we, we sign up to things, we participate, um, because that's going to be a big question for the nations. And we're going to need that support and that consensus. And some people will give their consensus, some people withhold it, and that's their right. But I think that's the conversations we're kind of having now leading into the next term um, of the Assembly um, when it comes to a statewide treaty and traditional owner treaties, you know, here in Victoria. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Nagara. Uh, I do have a question here, and I'll put this to you, Ruben. Uh, do treaties have any focus on our ancestral ties and the metaphysical world and how that plays a part in our lives? Or are treaties only looking purely at the physical? Yeah, I mean, look, that's a really great question. And like I've said, with lots of these things we've been looking at, we've tried to make this process as open as possible to all those considerations. Uh, and the idea that we're making sure we're referencing and acknowledging the significance of Aboriginal law and law and cultural authority. And with that, the ideas around the significance of elders and eldership and ensuring that we're respecting the work of ancestors before us. Um, to my mind, I think that leaves open all those possibilities to have those, um, those things considered as part of a treaty process. And it really is going to be up to the groups that go to sit down and have that next phase of negotiation to work out what elements of that they want to be embedded within the treaty process. Important though as well, I think, it's, I think we need to recognise though that treaty is really about taking the, the rights that the state currently has and making sure that we can hand them over. And there are some rights though that the state has nothing to do with, that regardless of what the state says, we can exercise those rights. And those are other things we need to be mindful of that uh, we're not necessarily dependent on the state for agreement about some of those things about how we want to live our lives uh, as Aboriginal people, that we can take control of that ourselves and hopefully through this process empower us to be able to take control of that as well. But um, not everything we actually need to ask permission for the state for as part of treaty, some things we can just say, this is our right and this is what we're going to do. Deadly. Thank you so much for that, Ruben. Um, now, I'm just conscious of the time. We do have about four minutes left. So I will just ask this last question. Uh, if there are any more questions that our audience does have, I would suggest chucking them into the chat now. Our moderator, Megan, will take note of all the questions that we have here. And as I said previously, uh, she will pass those on to me, and which I will be able to pass those on to our members directly for an answer. Uh, so this last question I'll put to you, Alistair. Uh, where is all the funding coming from and how are we going to keep autonomy from government? Good question. I think that's to be negotiated. And 
we're obviously going to have an investment from the government for the first initial phase of the fund. I think Ruben mentioned that earlier, but we're going to have to make it sustainable. So we're going to have to negotiate that. I think that'll be a big part of that first treaty, that first statewide treaty. And traditional owner groups themselves might want to negotiate that, you know, in relation to their country, how that investment looks. So they're all on the table. I think that's the important thing. That's all on the table for discussion to be determined by our involvement in the treaty process. So um, that's the exciting thing, I, I think. Um, we could set up a sustainable future for our people. And, um, you know, after all the things that we've been through as a community, I think this is a way for us to rebuild our nations and to start talking about nation building and our aspirations. So I think we're pretty well set up to do that. And in the next phase, all of those um, questions, hopefully we can answer. But can I just say too, before we leave, I want to thank everybody for coming along and joining us. Um, some great questions, really awesome, deadly questions. And then come and talk to us whenever you like see us around the traps. Um, I'm sure you'll probably see us. So yeah, but yeah, deadly to have you all here. Thank you so much for that, Alistair. And I'd like to reiterate uh, what you just said, Alistair. I think it's, I'd like to first off say thank you to all three of our panelists tonight. Uh, there have been a lot of questions fired at you and we really do appreciate how knowledgeable and how succinct you were able to answer those. Um, now, just before everyone does leave, I would also like to mention that the Treaty Day Out is uh, currently is gonna be happening on the 1st of October. Uh, it's gonna be down at Jaja Wurrung Country over at the Bendigo Showgrounds. Uh, there's going to be a lot of deadly artists going to be down there. And I think it's a really good opportunity, whether or not you're a mob or whether or not you're an ally. It's a beautiful way for all of us to all come together and celebrate this beautiful culture that we can be all a part of. And I think that in itself is what the representation and the ideology of treaty is. All of us coming together and we're, we're walking on this journey towards an agreement and towards a new, uh, better society. So... Yes, as I said, I would like to thank uh, our panelists and I'd also like to thank all of our attendees for coming down tonight and listening, listening to us yarn on. Um, we really do appreciate it. And it's just amazing to see so many people connected and so many people interested in what's happening in regards to the journey of treaty. Uh, so I think we'll leave it there. And uh, once again, thank you all so much. And as I mentioned, uh, if you do have any questions, if you do have any more questions, I'll quickly just chuck in uh my work email as well into the chat so if you have any further questions just pass them straight over to that email address whoop i've sent that just to nagara my apologies i i know <laughs> i was sending stuff to the chat to the participants but i don't know if they got it <laughs> i think i was sending it to you guys sorry yeah i'm just <laughs> noticing that now now nah, that's to everyone there now so as i said that's my uh, uh work email address so if you have any further follow-up questions in regards to this q a or if you'd just like to have a bit more of a yarn about it more than happy to organize a bit of a one-on-one -on -one and uh just talk about the issues and talk about uh any of the details we've discussed tonight on a more personal level so once again, thank you all for joining us. And once again, thank you to our panelists. Enjoy the rest of your night, guys. <laughs>